workshop for Thursday, October 29th. Um, roll call, all counselors are present and there are 10 attendees on this call as well. And the first item is the council discussion on planning next steps to learn about racial and social equity issues in Orono. Uh, and I'd first like to just start with a quick rundown of what's been going on. Um, I'd like to start off the discussion by stating that we are continuing to reach out to consultants and members of the university community to frame the most impactful and substantive actions the town council can take to ensure that Orono is equitable and inclusive for all community members. The actions taken by council will differ from town staff and operations. Council has a duty to review its ordinances and policies for inclusivity in equity, making sure ordinances prom promote the goal of accepting, respecting, and valuing differences, including attributes such as age, race, gender, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, gender expression, sexual identity, ability, language, family circumstances, and cultural backgrounds. The council routinely receives updates on staff trainings and encourages the staff to continue to learn about inclusivity in the workplace and as service providers. I would like to address one question brought by Orno citizens regarding how an inclusivity committee is different from the tree board. The tree board as well as the planning board and the Board of Appeals are required by state law and follow a state mandate that council cannot alter. Other committees are formed by the council after a mission statement or charge is created by council. So hopefully we will get to that point um, with, this, with this topic. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Megan to help us discuss next steps. Thank you, Cindy. Um, Bill and I practiced me sharing my screen today. So fingers crossed, I think it's gonna work this time. All right. Okay, did it work? <laughs> yes? I Can somebody, I can't see my screen anymore. Nothing yet. So. Nothing yet, okay. Well, that's interesting. Share my screen. Yep, I think you got it. Oh, hooray. Okay, technology, all right. Um, okay, so um, I am a visual learner and um, I just feel like we could maybe benefit from uh, being able to sort of see this in an organized way as we discuss it. Um, sometimes words go all over the place for me anyway. Um, all right, so I wanted to kind of take us through um, a timeline of where we could go with this um, and quickly uh, begin by recapping some of the, the goals of what we're trying to accomplish and then the challenges that we have uh, dealt with to make it all come together. So the council actions originally planned um, involved um, education and training around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion as it relates to policy making. Um, one of the things that we were trying to do first is to find a facilitator that would meet council's specific needs um, in terms of its ability to talk about um, these issues through the lens of policy making, which is a pretty kind of specific thing. And there, there aren't a lot of trainers that are dealing with that. Um, and then council's legal obligations uh, regarding public meetings. One of the things that we uh, we're trying to figure out is uh, how do we have training and education that um, could potentially be personal or best done in um, sort of um, intimate settings, but with the requirement that when the seven of us are together working on town business, it's a public meeting. Um, after that phase, we intended to move on to a community roundtable with stakeholders. Um, the goal of that uh, roundtable conversation. One goal was to identify council's identity-based blind spots in policy making. Um, briefly, side note, what do I mean by identities? This is what's commonly referred to as the big 10, ability, age, body size or shape, ethnicity, gender, which includes gender, gender identity and gender expression, internationalism or first language, um, race, religion, sexual orientation and socioeconomic stat status or class. 
Um, so identifying council's identity-based blind spots in policymaking, meaning where are our own identities and our own privileges keeping us from seeing different aspects of policy and how they affect other people in our community. Um, second, understanding how town policies will impact people with marginalized identities in particular. So those were our goals for that roundtable stakeholder conversation. And then finally, figuring out after that conversation, um, what a sustainable mechanism would be to address these issues. What's the best fit for our community based on identified needs of its members? Um, one of the things that has, um, that I've been kind of doing in the background is, is taking a look over the last few months at how other communities have addressed um, commissions and committees um, related to these issues. Um, uh, I, folks may have heard about uh, South Portland. Uh, Margaret Brownlee is a fellow Emerge alum. We were in the same class together and we've been talking about this. Uh, she brought a human rights commission to the South Portland City Council, which was adopted um, and started there a few months ago. And um, she's done quite a lot of research and some of the research she shared with me um, she had looked at communities of all kinds of sizes and she was focusing on ones more the size of South Portland, but in the process, she had also looked at some smaller communities and that was a good starting point for me. So over the last few months, I've been looking into those communities and others that have uh, populations comparable to Orno and may have you know, um, colleges nearby, just to look at the different ways that different communities um, address these issues with either a commission or a committee or um, a citizens um, group. So one of the things that we were hoping to get out of action item number two here was a path forward to item number three, which is what's the best fit for our particular community. <clears throat> now, next steps. Um, so one of the driving forces behind um, this initiative all along has really been an acknowledgement that the, the seven of us counselors, because of our own identities, may well have some significant blind spots when it comes to setting policy that is um, truly equitable and inclusive. So this past week, um, I had a meeting on campus with Anila Karunakar and Rob Jackson at UMaine's Multicultural Center, a uh, student center. And I described what we were trying to accomplish and why. And I was asked a very good question, which is, um, what work has council done to investigate these blind spots, particularly in regards to race? Now, as a group in a formal organized way, the answer is nothing so far. Um, we've had some struggles finding a facilitator that would work with our particular needs, but still we there's a lot that we could have perhaps done that we haven't done yet. Um, and why this is important, um, asking individuals with marginalized identities to come to the table and speak to their experiences and their community's experiences in front of a group of people that represent authority like council is asking for a level of trust. Asking individuals with marginalized identities to come to the table and talk about how those identities impact their experience of living in Orono, even if council has the best of intentions is asking for intellectual and emotional labor. And when I return to that question, what work has council done to understand its various identities, the answer to that question underscores what I perceive as a lack of equity. Um, because we're in fact asking folks to do work that we as a group publicly have not done ourselves. So I think the last thing that any of the seven of us want is to pay lip service to equity and inclusion. Uh, we don't wanna just do something for the sake of doing something uh, for show and then just kind of go back to business as usual. Sure, we could put out a statement, which we, we have, we can have a meeting, we can say, yes, we'll start a committee, but in what ways are we as a council demonstrating in a meaningful, tangible way that we're invested in doing the work to think about our own filters and identities, particularly whiteness, before inviting black and brown individuals to sit at our table and tell us what it's like to live here. Fortunately, Anila and Rob um, were generous enough to brainstorm with me about how we can make this all happen. Um, and I'd like to share that proposal with you now. <clears throat> so this would be a proposed timeline um, that would begin, you know, as soon as we can get started. I said November, just for the fact that we only have a couple days left in October, um, through January, late January, beginning of February. <clears throat> so first, this would be um, individually guided, but publicly shared training and education over this 
time period of about three months. Um, the Humane Multicultural Student Center trainings, when I, when I sat with Anila and Rob and I explained in detail kind of the legal issues that we have as seven counselors who are obligated to invite the public into our conversations when we talk about town business or when we have a meeting that's specifically for the seven of us, um, that was when um, Anila and Rob were able to get creative with me and we thought about ways that we could still do this training and still share it with the public but also kind of preserve how that training is best practiced, which is with, um, you know, with privacy um, and not necessarily in a public meeting. So <clears throat> the Humane Multicultural Student Center offers regular trainings um, on a uh, about a monthly basis. And the two main ones that they do are understanding diversity and inclusion, which kind of goes over that the Big Ten um, identities that I just talked about earlier, and then transforming self for racial equity. Um, one way that we could um, do this kind of work with, uh, with still um, meeting our legal obligations um, is that we would be able to actually just sign up as private citizens, as individuals for these trainings that would have, you know, other community members in them. Um, and if we wanted to be able to talk about town business, we'd have to limit it to um, no more than two counselors in a session. Um, but if more than two counselors wanted to sign up for the same session, and again, there are multiple sessions of these over the next few months, um, we could do that with just the agreement that we would not talk about town business. So we would just talk about our own personal experience and, um, and not make it about town business. So we would not be violating our legal obligation if we were to do it that way. Um, so that would be the work that we could complete. And for accountability, um, during the committee and representative reports portion of the monthly town meetings from November to February, uh, counselors can provide updates on the trainings attended. So you don't have to go, I mean, you can choose how much information you'd like to share about your experience in the training. You could simply talk about it in general terms just to let the public know what, what you did and what you learned. You could get a little um, more personal if you chose to, but it's just a way um, for us to be accountable for um, for going through uh, these trainings and thinking about these issues in a focused way. And then another thing that we brainstormed and came up with here was that we could, um, council could do shared readings on race, privilege, and identity. A couple of examples that Anila and Rob and I talked about were How to Be Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi and Me and White Supremacy by Leila Saad. Um, although we could certainly talk about other suggestions if, if other counselors had good ones. One of the reasons why how to be an anti-racist is um, a good option is because there are a lot of companion materials out there um, that contextualize the reading experience. And also the book itself, I'm, fl I'm flipping through my copy here. Um, also the book itself kind of breaks down into specific kind of uh, focal points like biology, ethnicity, culture, behavior, class, um, there's several, so <clears throat> space, gender, sexuality. So it looks at racism through different focused lenses in, in, um, from chapter to chapter. So it would, that would be a good choice. Um, so the work is that, you know, on our own time, at our own pace, we could be um, reading these materials together. Um, and then for accountability during council work uh, workshop time, we could set aside um, time to discuss portions of the chosen text over that few month period, perhaps with different counselors briefly presenting on segments of the text for the public's benefit. Um, let's see. So why would we try this particular approach? Um, well, it would be an opportunity for counselors to explore their own filters and blind spots related to their identities that may impact policymaking. It's an opportunity for council to hold a series of ongoing public conversations about race, identity, and privilege. Um, it demonstrates a willingness on council's part to engage in and commit to the process of systemic change because that's what we're really looking for is how do we make institutional systemic change um, and change the way that we operate. How uh, it allows council to think about how to build this reflective process into its regular op operations. Um, and it's also prep work for a stakeholder roundtable discussion at which we are asking similar work and engagement from community members. So it's a way of trust building saying, you know, 
we're not just going to sit here as this blank wall and ask you to come to our table and tell us things and then we may or may not do anything about it um, but to show that we're really engaged in the process and that this is a community effort and that includes us participating in the effort so the the <clears throat> proposed timeline then would be that um, november through february council would do its own work um, on education on training and on having public discussions um, about these issues that would be beneficial to us and to the public in january or february um, we would be able to uh, convene the community roundtable with stakeholders and then at that point um, council would be able to really have a good sense and discuss what a sustainable mechanism would be to address these issues in the long term I know that most government organizations are not doing it this way. Um, having lawmakers essentially form kind of a book club and report publicly on, you know, training seminars that they've received um, is not the norm for most councils or legislative bodies. And I know that we have folks who have requested very specific actions on a shorter timeline than the, uh, um, the approach that is proposed here. Um, but if we're talking about long term meaningful change and we want the university communities to partner with us in, in doing this, um, we have to do it the right way and we have to start somewhere. And I'm hoping that my fellow counselors here that you'll agree and that we can begin the work as soon as possible. So with that, I am eager to hear your thoughts. Let me stop sharing my screen. Um, Megan, one of the other things that you had added um, the other day was that it would also be very hard to convene um, university students or um, faculty at this particular point in time. It's a very busy time of year for them. Yeah. Yes, it's busy. And also one of the things that um, that Anila wanted to underscore is that the student populations that they work with at the multi Multicultural Center, it's not just that it's the, you know, November is the end of the semester and um, it's a busy time for folks, but also the students that they work with and the faculty and, and staff that um, connect with that department. Um, you know, the, the election season, it's a difficult, this is a difficult time. People are worried, they're, um, they're anxious, there's a lot going on for people. And so November, trying to convene um, you know, a conversation in November, just timing wise is not great for those uh, folks connected to campus. And um, so that that's a, a logistical concern. But then, you know, Anila and Rob both did also have a lot of um, concerns that uh, it would be more effective if council did some work on its own um, to do the same work that we're asking folks who come to the table to do. And I, I agree. And I'm, I'm really glad they were um, willing to brainstorm with me. Megan, you see these um meetings as Zoom meetings? I feel like we don't have much of a, a choice. I, I wish that they could be in person because I I just don't like I I don't I don't think that Zoom is as conducive to real interaction. Um, but we would just have to I guess see where we're at at the time in February. So Meg, I, I appreciate that you took the time to go do this. Um, I think it's obviously very important. I am glad that uh, Anila and Rob um, provided us what they think is, is the proper way of doing this. And Anila being a person of color is even more significant. We can, um, it's kind of hard to kind of navigate this sometimes because we get told by people, do, 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 do. but. I've always been kind of trying to find a space where somebody who actually lives in that, that's their life, that's who they are, to kind of help us um, navigate and understand what are the best steps to really show that we're committed to, um, to the process of understanding and, and recognizing uh, racial injustice. So I, I, I thank you for taking the time to do this because it's, it's helped me um, better understand um, I, I try to to read a book here and there, um, and these these items I, I'm actually I will be ordering these just simply for my own 
own education. Um, but I, I think this is a very good first steps um, to listen to the individuals who provide us with the best understanding of what we should be doing. So um, that's where I'm at and thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a good first step. Um, I have really mixed feelings about this. I, I agree with a lot. I appreciate the work that's done. It feels, uh, and I'm guilty by this too, it feels incredibly late. I think there is a huge percent of the population, um, significant, you know, a uh, huge percentage of this population is kind of hard to get a head around, but an incredibly significant uh, part of the population that feels unheard that feels uh, not maybe not comfortable or not safe in being able to voice their concerns, and and I think um, I think everybody needs to be heard because there are some people in the community that are speaking out. It's great that we have this. It's great that we have a book club coming up and, and we're 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 tackling these issues. Um, but I look at the timeline and you know this starting to wrap up in February. Then we can move to the next step. Well, I'll be honest. I think it's 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 clear. I'll say it. I'm not running again. I'm done in March, you know, so I'm glad that I'm having this training, but all of a sudden, here we are, you know. Um, so this is why I'm kind of frustrated. I haven't known the answer. I haven't, I've been processing this myself and it's easy for me to kind of forget about it because I don't live it every day. Um, I think people were speaking out last time. I was a little disappointed with how our last meeting left, but I think people have the right to get their comments out there, especially in a public meeting as that was. Um, but I just think I'd like to I'd like to hear a commitment from everybody that, that we take this seriously. I think we all feel that way, but I haven't heard it, you know. And um, and I'm not I'm not upset. I'm not trying to poke, poke poke the bear or anything. But it's just like this is such a hard thing. And it's I think there's so many people that don't feel heard and don't feel acknowledged. And I think we owe them at least to say that we do hear them and we are moving forward on this. I think this is a good first step. But I don't. I do think it's late. Um, Sam, can I respond to the timeline well, things? Because sure, I'm really happy sure. that one you One more thing, one more thing, and then okay. absolutely. Um, but also, I think we need to let them know what the what our goal is for, for staff training, because I think that's equally important. I, th I think this absolutely has to begin with us. We need to go through this. Um, and I know that I was scheduling so hard. I'm, I struggle to find time for a lot of the stuff that town council consists of. Um, but I mean, so I don't know, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but I just wanted to get that. I had a lot of feelings about this. I just wanted to get this out. And it's, so, it's such an incredibly personal thing for everybody. So anyway, with that, go ahead. I'm sure that Cindy or Sophie will wanna address the staff training piece because it's we, we're not leading that charge that's been ongoing. And I'm sure they can say more about that, um, the training that staff's been um, going through for quite a while now um, and what's planned coming up. But I'm glad that you brought up the, the issue of a timeline and how it's late. Yes, it's late. I don't like that this has taken as long as it has either. And I think that part of that is a good um, object lesson for the seven of us because one of the things that happens, um, well-meaning corporate entities or government entities or just um, groups of people, of white people in positions of authority, when when something happens and you want to address it, what's the go-to knee-jerk reaction? Have a training. And not that training's bad, training is good, but um, there's sometimes a sense, particularly in the corporate world, but I think that it extends to government as well, of, well, if we just, we'll have a trainer in and we'll sit in a room and they'll talk to us about, um, they'll talk to us about diversity and then we'll have done it. And to me, sometimes the danger in that is that it, it checks a box, but, it's it's the go-to and I was just I, that was my I, that's what I thought as well I thought well okay we'll we'll find a trainer and it turned out that finding a trainer was actually the wrong move because um, we couldn't find one that met our very specific needs as a council but in the meantime as Anila was kind enough to point out to me critically but with love <laughs> we could have been doing the book club we could have been going to trainings on our own and talking about them. There are other things that the seven of us could have been doing all of this time and we haven't, me included, I'm just as guilty. So um, I think that it's, yes, the timeline is disappointing, but I also think that we are all, we're grappling with our own filters and our own lenses as individuals 
as we come into this process. And that clearly had an impact on how this whole thing unfolded. Now to speak to your issue of, um, well, I'm not running again. And thank you for bringing that up as well because uh, I'm sad that you're not running again, but, um, but that was a question that Cindy posed when I first uh, pitched this to her um, ahead of this meeting. And she said, well, people cycle on and off council. I mean, we all do this book club and this training, but then what next? Um, and you know, one of the things that I'm hoping that doing this work is almost like a pilot in a way of how do we do this work and then fold it into the normal operations of council. So for example, council is legally required by the state to have a legal training every year to talk about how not to break the law with your emails and all that good stuff, right? Um, and so we go through that, that legal training once a year, just so that every new counselor who cycles on can get it. There's no reason why we can't figure out pieces of this kind of training and this kind of re reflective work um, that we can build into our normal council operations, you know? So I want to figure out ways to not just do this now because it's happening now, but to build it into the sort of the institutional operation of council so that it's part of all councils, no matter who cycles on and off. I think that's a great goal. Thank you, Meg. Um, I also would just like to respond that I think that we, or I, as your representative, have been struggling with how to, to formulate what it is that council is going to do to make substantive and systemic change. Um, that doesn't mean that staff hasn't been doing trainings. And I would ask Sophie if you would speak to that, because I think you've got some new additions to that as well. I think it's important for people to understand that um, staff has been doing um, anti-harassment, anti-racism, anti-bias, implicit bias training um, for the last many years. Um, I do think um, that it's important the climate around us is changing on a departmental basis. We're evaluating our operations as we do all the time. Um, but we are also um, working, there has been a team in place. Um, of, it's a subset of the management team that deals with diversity and inclus inclusion. Um, that team is meeting with um, student life weekly uh, to talk about how we can um, address um, and build networks around um, town operations. Um, we are, um, I just finished a training through the um, Governmental Finance Officers Association about um, the ethics and equity um, issues around in creating and imposing municipal service fees, fees for service. Um, we have, I'm in the midst of a embodied racist, anti-racism, five week embodied anti-racism training. Um, I'm, ha I mean, part of what people, um, what has made things very tricky in this um, time is that staff can't all get together in one place. And so we have been trying to tackle this on a department by department basis, and that is not normally the way we train. We normally train as a, as a group. So um, we are working um, to bring a trainer. We've identified a trainer who um, will do smaller group Zoom um, meetings first with senior staff, and then we would figure out how to potentially change it. Um, looking at filters and communication. I mean, while everybody would like to affect change and um, the way people look at the world, as an employer, um, we control people's behavior. So we have to we have to spin the training a little bit to talk about um, communication um, as kind of the method of delivery with this and people's filters, both giving and receiving um, communication. So um, that we are, I talked briefly with Cindy about the potential of doing an operations survey. Um, I have feelers out to a company to help us develop um, the appropriate questions um, and to do it in a way that, well, I don't think we need it to be 
uh, you know, to meet the research standard of statistical relevance and um, for all the research standard. I do think that um, it makes sense to ensure that we are um, getting truly answering the questions that we're putting out there and we're getting it in the hands of the right people to answer the questions, which is everybody. Um, so that is um, kind of where we as a staff are um, in general. The normal trainings continue in smaller groups, but those are um, the general inclusivity, um, respectful work environment, uh, professional being pleasant and professional and providing services in an equitable manner. And Sophie, just to just to clarify, that survey would go out to um, citizens. It's not it's not a staff survey. It's a yeah. So you know, one of the things that's a challenge is when you think about creating um, training for an entity. You start out with a topic, you train on it, and then you wait and you're evaluating. You're looking for. Um, incidents or feedback that tells you that either the training is working or it's not working. Um, in this arena, um, the feedback that we look for is, you know, are there complaints? Are there concerns that are raised? And we are not getting those, which do doesn't mean that I don't think that we have room to grow. It means that um, the standard ways that we have for um, getting that feedback are not working um, if there is a problem. So my um, initial sense was um, if we could have an operations focused survey, not about what people think about equity and inclusivity or in general or the national norm or what communities should do, but rather what is your experience or perception of the the town of Orono's operations. Um, we would be able to take that and be able to build um, some new training based on that. Uh, Sophie, thank you for that update. Um, I just wanted to get back to Megan's presentation. Um, Megan, I really appreciate the work you've done on this topic and I think you've outlined an excellent path forward for us and I'm very supportive of it. I want to thank you for the work that you've done and it sounds like uh, it, you you invested time to find out what other towns and towns more like ours than South Portland, uh, towns with universities, how very small, but we didn't actually hear what you learned about those towns. So I'd, I'd be interested in hearing that uh, because it, when we look at the much larger scale at the state level, the state has a a commission, a permanent commission now on racial, indigenous, and main tribal populations. And they have gone through proposed legislation and talked about how it would, would or would not differentially impact the, those communities. And we are a legislative body where you know, we create ordinances uh, to, that describe how we would manage our town. And we, because we come to that work with this, all of our biases from living in this culture and and, and our privilege, we probably also have created ordinances or will produ produce things in the future that if evaluated by a team of people who have a much better lens at, at doing those kinds of evaluations, they could give us feedback. So I had, I think it's great that you went looking for other communities that had those had some kind of committee, but we didn't hear why you then switched to, we should be trained individually because of our the things that we that's, lack and we do lack, but I, I would, I'm not, focused on getting information from other people. That's not what I said, Laurie, with respect. Um, what, what I said was I have been doing this research um, on my own in preparation for the day when we are talking about what kind of long-term permanent um, way we could address uh, these issues would be. Um, what I what I said in my presentation is what I learned during the process of doing research in all these different communities is that all these different communities, even if they all had 11,000 residents or whatnot ballpark, uh, were the same size as us, had very different ways of constructing some sort of a group, whether it was a human rights commission, whether it was a DEI 
um, committee, whether it was a citizens advisory group, the different communities had very different approaches and these bodies, whatever the bodies were, had very different objectives and goals and ways of interacting with local government and with the population. And that is entirely dependent on the community's needs. So for example, um, you know, if you look at some states in the North Midwest that have um, in a, a really large population of Arab or Muslim um, residents, they, their town or city government might have a very different need in that population than a different community that has a different population. So what I learned and what is, what is <laughs> driving me to keep pushing for, hey, before the seven of us who have a lot of relative privilege, when you add it all up, sit here and say what we think is best to do, why don't we actually talk to people and gather that information first? Because what I learned in my research process from looking at different communities is that it's very much responsive to the, the specific individual community when it works. When it doesn't work, it's just a one size fits all approach. And so I want this to work and I'm invested in making it work. And I think that means gathering information and talking to people so that we can make something that works for our community. Right, and Sophie's just told us that the group, the method that she has, the outreach and the questions they've asked, that they're not, that's not working to get that information. So I thought that we had heard from other people who presented to us that if you had a committee or a group of people who were people of color that live in our town, and they were the ones who were reaching out to request information from people in our town, that then those people who had something to say would feel safer than talking to the counselors, both because we're uh, privileged and white, and also because there's a certain level of uh, distance by talking to a group that's not us, that will then relay that information to us. So I, I wonder what happened with that. That seemed like a really wise idea. Uh, Sorry, I, I think that's a that's a stakeholder group that, or that we were hoping to pull together. Um, we're, I think that will happen towards the end of January, uh, beginning of February, if we can get all of our um, work done ahead of time. And so that's what we're, we're hoping for. I don't think, and um, Sophie, you may wanna clarify, but I don't think we, it's that we're not getting information. It's that um, people, we're hoping for, to get more information about how we're, we are interacting or how we're processing this information. Um, yeah, and I also think there's a very big difference between town operations and council policy and engagement and representing the community process. Um, but yes, I would agree, Cindy. And um, quickly, just because there was a question, I think in the, um, from the participants about, um, I've been I've been focusing on, uh, in this presentation, I talked a lot about the university because there are just so many intersections of different communities that are connected through the university. Um, and that was sort of my piece of this puzzle that I was working on, but Cindy um, and Sophie were also reaching out to the Penobscot Nation and to the Islamic Center of Maine. And, and so there's a, there are other non-university entities that we've been, um, reaching out to and, and bringing to the table. It isn't just uh, university-based. Yeah. Um, Sophie, you, did you have a training you forgot to mention? Well, I just, um, one of the things that has come up in the municipal world is um, we know that in larger cities, um, land use training, uh, land use um, ordinance development has been used in a discriminatory discriminatory process. Um, so talking with Kyle and with Cindy and Megan, um, one of the things that we're hoping to be able to bring to council is a um, joint staff council training um, with the planning, um, community development staff, management, and, um, and council to talk about what are the things that we may inadvertently do that marginalizes groups of people? I think we'd start with the big 10, that list that um, Megan um, talked about at the very beginning. So I think that's, can I say, 
who's talking now? <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> um, do you, so here's my, here's my thinking and I'm, I'm feeling a little mixed as well. Um, I just took a training with the MMA, which is on implicit bias. I am more comfortable picking my own, doing my own trainings and doing my own work than I am in having someone tell me where I need to go and what I need to do. Um, I have been through the University of Maine Diversity Leadership Institute. Um, that has uh, that was fairly relevant in the work that I was doing um, at the University of Maine. Um, so I'm very familiar with it. And I know Sarah's in the audience and she's familiar with it as well. Um, I feel imposed upon. I feel um, that, uh, that I know who I am and what I need um, and that I'm personally right now involved in something called environmental justice um, because that's the line of uh, interest that I have right now and working with the council and working with um, uh, and working with the environment. And that's also a new field, much like the land use planning and how do we, um, how are we imposing our, um, you know, our, our land use on, and it's not land use, but it's more like the river and, um, you know, on people that, and the mills and things like that, on people that have no um, wherewithal to hire attorneys or to fight back or to be, um, you know, or to be able to talk about like where they live in the world. And that's also a part of, um, that's also a part of this. It's also a part of who we are as people and what we do as council, um, more so, um, not more so, I can't say that, but I mean, what we do as council and how we make decisions about things. It, it's the same, it runs along the same, you know, the same lines, um, um, but it's also something new that's coming up. And if I was going to focus on something right now, um, that's what I'd be focusing on. And I'm writing and I'm reading, I'm reading lots of books and all kinds of um, ways that council um, as a, and, and a community can really look at, um, you know, where we put, uh, where we put um, uh, low income housing, how we treat our low income people. Um, and so I, you know, so I, I get this on a level, I think that, um, probably people don't understand. I do get this. Um, but I really, I'm really, I'm really going to have to push back. I don't have a problem with trainings. I like to do trainings. I always learn something, but I do have a problem with somebody telling me where I need to go and how I need to be trained at the moment. Well, I'm, I know you can shake your head, Megan, but I do have a problem and I'm being honest. No, no, I, I just want to say it's Cheryl. Cheryl. I mean, no, 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 no. Want, I'm still I talking. I am opinion. interested in this and I don't want to come off as somebody that doesn't want to do, you know, doesn't want to do this like the last time that we were that we were here. And I, I, I'm just telling you that this is how I feel about this right now at this moment. Yes, no, thank you. The head shaking was just to say the training itself is not prescriptive. So Anila and Rob were not suggesting you have to do this training from the Multicultural Center or else it doesn't count. I mean, that's that, and I hope that's not what came across when I presented it. It was just, those are some examples of trainings that are happening, whether we participate, they're ongoing. So it's, if we say we're gonna have a council training, it has to be a public meeting. If there is a training going on and we go to it, then it's not a public meeting unless we're three or more of us and we talk about the town. But so if, you, if you're going to um, a training of your own and what you were just talking about sounds so interesting. And I think that that's, that's what I'm trying to get at here is that um, we would bring these private experiences and the work that we're doing privately to a public forum, just as you're describing. So I would love for you know, a committee representative, maybe November, if you're willing, like you can tell us about that training that you just described and tell us about environmental justice. Like the point is that um, council as an entity, individual counselors might be doing this work on their own. I mean, I am in fact reading this book, like I am doing the work on my own. 
but as a group, I think one of the things that that our community as yes, our community as a whole, and in particular, the people with marginalized identities that we're asking to come to the table, they would really, people would really benefit from seeing the transparency of us talking about race and about bias and about inequity in a public forum. And so um, I would absolutely love if, if counselors had other trainings that they wanted to go to and bring to talk about, that would be even more enriching than just all of us going to the same couple of trainings. So yeah, Thank so you, it's Megan. not prescriptive. That, that makes me feel much more comfortable. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I absolutely agree. And um, would love if Cheryl is up for it to, to have a, a discussion about that or a presentation or something in November. Um, I think maybe what we could do if, you know, other counselors can pick up the trainings or have training on their own. I have a feeling that Sam, maybe you've already done some in your line of work. Um, maybe we can move this along a little bit quicker and, you know, and start reaching out to, to others while we're doing the trainings, if that you know, makes sense. Because what, what I think ultimately what we, where we wanna to get to is an understanding so that we can go to the next step of, is it, does it look like a commission? Does it look like a committee? Does it look like an advisory group? I think that's where we wanna to get to, but council needs to, to have a listening session, I think, before we can do that. Well, once again, if you're waiting, you're proposing that there's a listening session where people who have felt discriminated against would come to us and tell them about that, that's, it's- No, I was thinking more, again, a, a stakeholder, committee group where where people who know what's going on in their um, environment are, are more willing to come forward. I, I really don't want to put an individual who's had traumatic experience on Zoom to relive that experience. I would much rather have um, a community leader, you know, relay some of that and, and some of how we could make uh, make it better, make it equitable and, and inclusive so that that traumatic experience never happens again. Um, so what, we, what happened to the request we had of citizens to have some kind of committee that would help the council make these kind of decisions? I think that that personally, I think that's a step that has to come after we meet with stakeholders so that we understand what the committee is charged with, what, what's the makeup of the committee, and what's their authority, if they have it, if they just advise. I guess I was looking for people who would, be, who would meet with the stakeholders on our behalf, because they, and those people would be people who themselves live in our community and are from marginalized groups. That I, I think the stakeholders already meet with those individuals. Excuse me? I would, I would think that the stakeholders that we wanna to bring to a meeting with us already meet with those individuals. You know, um, maybe we have the, the head of uh, IAM come. Um, you know, there's, there's different, I think there's different stakeholders that we need to hear from so that we can we can make the correct charge for this whatever it would be for this next step so um so I, go ahead Lori. i feel like when, when we have a question that's about planning we have staff that is excellent at figuring that out and trained and has life experience in planning and so when we have a question and as a as a council about planning, then we have a meeting and where we get a presentation from an excellent planner who has done a bunch of background to tell us how to move forward. And because we do not have staff that are human resources and focused on racial justice and equity, in this case, it seems that we need to find people who would be our advisors about how to move forward and, and whether or not we have in reading books or going to training or have life experience where we have, uh, like for example, I've hired 
Native American people. I have hired people of color. I have hired trans people. I have hired lesbians. I have, uh, you know, of uh, this life experience of, uh, of a veteran, like of working with disabled people, of trying to make my own workplaces places that are are helping people who have been marginalized to be employed. That does not make me the person who should be advising the council about how we do better because I just do it as a as not as an expert. And so I think that just as we have an expert come and tell us about the thorny issues or about marijuana or whatever the things we are addressing that are thorny issues, and this is a thorny issue. This is this is life and death for some people. It's it's their economic and and social personal realities. And our town and our state, we have data from our state that our state is not doing very well. If we have 5% people of color and 25% of people who get COVID are people of color. We just have, you know, and, and, no, and Orno is no different than the rest of the state on, on that we have not done better. And we need people who teach us, tell us, who's, this is their business of figuring out and advising us on how we do better. So. I love the idea of training and I love that we would join book groups. I think those are all really great suggestions. I love the that the people in our committee, our, our staff and our council have been thinking about these things. It's great. However, that's not what we get when we have a planning issue or like, and that I want us to behave more like that, that we bring in people who are, this is their expertise to advise us. Um, I think one of the issues, what we're asking for from someone, there are very few people that can advise us on what a council and the policies that we're doing. Now, maybe if you want me to do more of a statewide or national search, maybe that would help. But we've we we have been. I think I think the idea of the personalized training is more of what we have been hearing about. Um, and that is why the training has been suggested because um, it's very hard for all of us to have a conversation in public about our private lives. So if we go, so if we have someone that's coming to present, then it's all public. And that's that can be an issue for some of us. Well, we have we have Cheryl has just started a new committee. Fabulous that there's a committee, but the committee meetings aren't public because it's a different format committee than say the finance committee where those committee meetings are public. So it seems like we already have a situation where there's a meeting that's called that could have a Zoom meeting that isn't public where people can have these discussions. So can't we make a committee much as not, we- Not if not if all of council is there. Well, I'm, I, that's what I'm saying. I don't, I, I, I want I want to be advised by people who are experts. I don't think we all need to be at the meeting at which the experts or the people who have personal experience, which makes them more experts than we are, when they're discussing, then they come back and they advise us. And that gives also the people who give deposition to them that cover of not having to be giving deposition in a public forum that's open for everyone to see. So I want to respect the people who would have would have things to share but are not comfortable coming forward. And we don't know who they are because they're not comfortable coming forward. I want to create a, a mechanism for them to come forward. And yes, if we've gone to trainings and we've read books, we should be better at, hopefully, because we believe in we're an education town. We believe in education, that education works and that you can do things to get better. So hopefully we would be better at hearing the information that gets brought to us. Just as when we're going to have a planning committee talk to us and we have things to read in advance, we read and we listen and we do our best at being better at making decisions because we've been educated. So that's what I, and it seems like that community group was also asking to have some kind of, to be, be, in, to be somehow our advisors or create a community group that is gonna be helping us to do better. 
I guess I just still don't understand. I mean, Lori, we have a mutual friend who is the social justice coordinator at the Islamic Center. I don't understand why you would have a problem with convening a community stakeholder discussion that would include people from different communities like this person who is our mutual friend to sit with council and to talk about the issues that their particular community faces living in Orno. So this isn't just invite, you know, anyone who wants to show up necessarily, but to, to as Cindy has said several times, um, people who are in a, who are leaders in different communities in this area who can sit at the table and talk constructively about the issues and how they intersect with town policy. And I, so I guess I, I really just- I didn't say that, and, that and again, I was interested in hearing from people who are leaders. I'm saying that they're, there's the people who are not leaders who have something to share with us are the people least likely to feel comfortable sharing it with us. And so I was looking for us to have a group that would be the place that those people could share that information, then that would then be brought to us. Okay, but our all along sort of the, the trajectory of this, at least, I don't know, I, I just, I really believe that we should ask questions and listen first before we decide what we should do. And I've, there have been several comments in the participants um, box about a one-time meeting. There's no, no one is saying that this has to be a one-time meeting. I think that what Cindy and I have been saying all along is this is a, this is an opening gambit. This is, we want to make real change that isn't just the seven of us. And it isn't just about what's going on right now in the world, that it's about how this town operates and how it interacts with its citizens and the people who are in this community in one way or the other. Long-term institutional systemic change. This is not gonna happen overnight and it's not gonna happen from one meeting, um, And but we need to start somewhere. And us deciding how it should be is probably not where it should start. So um, I don't understand, I, I really wouldn't, I don't wanna think that anybody would just get so attached to one idea that they would not want to try anything else, but it seems like we need to listen first and know this is not just we're going to have one meeting and that's the end of it, but we don't know what the steps are, as you've pointed out now several times, we don't know what the steps are to create this long term institutional systemic change, we need to find out. And one of the ways that we could do that is to talk to leaders in our community who are very familiar with what it's like person of color, to be of a religion that's not in the majority, to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and are also very familiar with the people in their community and the struggles that they're facing. So I don't understand what the objection is to this uh, approach, but if you could be more specific or come with something that's, you know, a little bit more shaped and defined other than just start a committee, because I'm not really sure we're trying to get there, and this is one trajectory path that could take us there, but we'll never know if we don't try it, I guess is what I'm thinking. Megan, I see this as building a foundation. I, I totally approve of this. I think that, that I know that people want this to hurry up for some reason, but if you build a foundation, you've got a stronger footing, and, and from there you can do anything, and that's where systemic change comes in. It's not just throwing something together and, you know, doing it like Bangor does it. It's really like really getting down, you know, getting down and, and listening, like you said, and um, and having something to stand on, you know, having something to to that's really firm and that's unshakable. And you have to start there. You have to. I, I'm a firm believer in really looking deeper at what we're at what we're doing and not just doing something because everybody else is doing it but really but really putting some meaning into what we're doing and and I agree we need that foundation first Cheryl I, I want to if, if, if I could I would like to say Cheryl that's, that's a good kind of where my mind was going also is that we're talking about first steps in but as through this conversation one of the things that I keep going back to is that with what we're dealing with right now, the biggest thing that I've just in my own little world of like talking to people is that we're not good listeners. And this could be an example tonight that are we all really listening to what we're doing? These are the first steps 
of doing something that's highly important in our community. And we just need to listen, not saying we're gonna do all these other things. We gotta start somewhere. This is the basic beginnings that are important to get where we need. And so, um, yeah, Cheryl, like you were saying, we, it's a foundation, we go from there. Um, so maybe to kind of wrap up this conversation, would council be comfortable with taking um, the month of November to read a book, get a training, um, and it, maybe Cheryl can give us some information on November. Um, I think that maybe uh, Megan and I can get together and start brainstorming stakeholder ideas that we could then float out to the rest of council. Um, and so we, because it isn't that stakeholder initial meeting is not gonna be something is, um, it's gonna be happen tomorrow because this is a lot of different schedules. So I think that we should start, start trying to get those people together as soon as we can. And um, so if, if council is agreeable to that, maybe, um, Megan, if, if you could, could you send out a, a link for those trainings or the books again that you recite, that you put on the, on the uh, presentation? Yep, sure. And, um, and just to cap it off with, um, with Anila, she, I, I did kind of talk to her about this, you know, we, we brainstormed this timeline and I said, you know, would it be fair to say that um, if council you know, makes this commitment and really demonstrates that it's invested in this process, um, you know, at that point for January, February, would you be comfortable helping us facilitate, you know, reaching out to people on campus, not just students, but staff and faculty as well, but be, to be able to find and gather stake, stakeholders for that conversation. And she's absolutely happy to do that. So. Great. Great. I think this is great. I absolutely commit to this. I think this is a little bit overdue based on my comments earlier but it was just here we are right let's sure. let's do this thank you okay um all right if there's no other comments on this item um i will move to um item number three and i'm going to ask tom perry to take over the meeting at this point tom you're mute you're muted you're muted tom Uh, yeah. Hear me now? No. Yep. Okay. So we'll move on to item number three. And item number three is tax acquired property disposal 25 College Heights. Um, we've received a couple of updates from Sophie on that recently. And I guess I'll pass it to Sophie to see what else we'd like to should like to say. I don't know if you want me to recap what I yeah. sent you. Um, okay. So um, last Monday night, council reviewed the bids and proposals um, for that it received for the disposal of 25 College Heights, which is a single family property that was acquired by the town for non-payment of property taxes. Um, as this discussion unfolded, um, it, it was reviewing um, the bids. There were nine bids received that included renovation and demolition. We council has heard over the last many years about um, perennial code enforcement issues at this property and the, the difficulty that the town had getting the former property owner to address them. So when, um, when the discussion started, um, the, it quickly turned to a discussion of whether or not the house could be renovated. And then people kind of focused on the demolition thinking that that was the best direction for the town to go. So as staff, most of the time we wrap things up for you nice and neat um, and would be able to answer most all of your questions. Our general practice is to take a hands-off approach with tax acquired property. Most of the time tax acquired property is sold simply through a sealed bid process and whoever provides the highest bid um, is the one that gets the um, property unless there is some major issue that council has with it. Um, so 
we had not done any kind of evaluation of this property. After our meeting where council decided to go to gave me direction, initial dis direction to reach out to the bidder that had um, proposed the demolition, I um, reached out um, for some assistance and um, confirmed that while it is not an ideal practice, the town could um, do a review of the property if the property was open and available for us to be able to do that. We couldn't take possession of the property. So um, I did, I had um, both of my code officers um, go through. So we have a code officer that is a life safety um, specialist, and I've got another code officer who um, has been doing this work for a long time, but also is a, um, has a hobby as a house flipper. So he is used to looking at houses that are in foreclosure and determining whether or not he wants to flip them. I, um, all I can, I need council to be very, I need to be so clear with council. This was not um, an in-depth house inspection. This was people who had a lot more knowledge than I did walking through the building and looking at it. Um, nothing that they have given us in terms of a laundry list should be taken by anybody as um, an absolute or a warranty by the town that this is the only work that needs to be done. And it um, certainly shouldn't be used for somebody to base their, um, what they think the parcel is worth. Um, but in summary, um, what they found was that they didn't see any major barriers to renovating this structure. They were actually quite surprised given what it looks like on the outside. Um, it's not in pristine shape as you saw from the laundry list that I gave you. Um, so at that point, I stopped everything. Um, I talked with Councillor Perry because he is chairing this particular discussion. Um, and I reached out to the town attorney, just, I don't want to, I don't want to create any kind of um, any due process issues. I don't want to create a problem where there's not a problem. But as your staff person, it felt like you were making your decisions based upon an assumption um, that um, I could not confirm. I can't confirm that, that assumption that this can only be demoed. So me bringing this back to you is not me suggesting that you need to do anything different. It's simply doing what I do all the time, which is I have information that I didn't have before and I'm sharing it with you. At this point, you can tell me you want me to do the exact same thing. You can tell me that you want me to do something different or you can tell me you wanna think about it some more. Um, this is not me trying to direct the process at all. It's simply wanting to make sure you have all the information that you need to make make your decision. Is that helpful, Tom? It is, and I appreciate the fact that you gathered some additional information. I, I did ask at that meeting, as you may recall, whether we had had anybody in the building and whether it was confirmed that it was really only to be demolished, because that's really the information that we had heard previously. Um, so thank you for arranging that information. Council members have questions or comments um, on the update of this situation? Um, I really appreciate that, uh, but that you brought someone in. Could you say again what your what the redux was of that visit? So um, you're looking for a summary, right? Yeah. So what they um, what they found is that it needs a new roof. It appears that the roof structures are okay, but shingles need to be replaced, and it's likely that some or all of the sheathing would have to work, but the roof is so open and the ceilings are so open that they got they were able to look at the actual structure of the roof and didn't see anything that concerned them um, in terms of being able to take the roof off and put the roof back on without having to redo the, the whole structure. The parcel needs to be cleaned up with um, outside trees and lawn attended to. The large tree, um, that was referred to that was pinned and, and cabled 
um, looks from the outside, you look at it and you would say, oh my word, that, that looks horrible. But um, the pinning and the cable was done um, appropriately and um, they think that it's probably pretty safe. Um, it doesn't show signs of falling. There are some trees out back that do need to be addressed because they're just kind of hanging there. There's a relatively limited amount of mold, most notably is surface mold upstairs. Um, ceiling and drywall, um, ceiling co coverings and drywall will need to be replaced. Much of the supply plum plumbing and piping has frozen, burst, and would need to be replaced or repaired. The electrical entrance panel has been updated. The outlets are all two-pronged, but can be updated with GFI. Flooring has, but has water damage, but appears to be salvageable. The bulkhead door entrance to the basement needs to be secured. The furnace is forced hot air and was last serviced in 2016, appears to be functioning. And there are no visible signs of rodents. So no feces, pulled insulation, nesting, um, things like that. So um, that is what, that, those were the highlights that they gave me. So, so it doesn't, sounds like it doesn't have to be a total teardown based on that. Yes. Um, Other questions um, or comments? Yes. Um, so we do have any more information about the question of um, whether of fees that the town charges versus, so whether, whether, for example, we accepted a higher bid and um, would that money revert to the original property owner, et cetera, et cetera. So you received an email that said um, pursuant to Title 36, Section 992, the town would have to give back anything except for its direct out-of-pocket expense or levy taxes, crude fees. Um, so the state of Maine provides for two different types of foreclosure action by municipalities. One, um, which is very longstanding, is called distraint. And that is when um, people used to, when people fell behind in taxes, they would send the sheriff out to a, a house and essentially arrest the house or seize the house and then uh, liquidate what they, what they had there until they fulfilled their, um, were made whole. Um, Section 992 applies to that process. We do not use the distraint process. We use the automatically foreclosing municipal tax lien process. Under that process, section 949 allows, would allow the council if it so chose to adopt an ordinance to govern what would happen to fees. And it gives some direction as to what that might look like. We don't have that, um, we don't have an ordinance that speaks to that. Therefore, council is essentially obligated to hold all of the money um, that it that it um, would get from a sale. The um, the own, there is a, a, some new provisions in the law that relate to having to put a house on the market um, and sell it and give the additional proceeds to the homeowner, but that's only in circumstances where it is a primary residence or a homestead and the owner is over is 65 years old or older. So um, in this particular case, this was not a primary residence. It's a vacant, it's a vacant parcel. So Tom, what is our what's our charge here tonight? To, so I think uh, I think our charge is is pretty clear, and and Sophie kind of outlined it at the beginning. Um, we have some new information. Right. Based on that new information, are we comfortable continuing down the path we established on Monday, and that was sending Sophie to negotiate with the bidder who was planning to demolish it, or Based on that new information, are we interested in revisiting that issue and looking at, at another way of disposing of the property um, based on um, 
the highest bidder based on whatever factors we want to consider, I guess. Okay, or I I I um I'm interested in revisiting um, with the new information, and I've kind of chosen my 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 property my my bidder, <laughs> but I don't know <laughs> how you <laughs> I don't know how you want to do it. I went well, back I, through given the new information. I went back through all the bids again, yep. and knowing that the house could be renovated, um, I choose uh, a per, I choose a. Well, I choose I chose I or J because I felt like they were um, they were going to be homeowners and they might have been they might be first time homeowners. Um, I really liked I's um, narrative about you know they're renters and they want to be homeowners and they've saved all this money and they're interested in um, starting a new life here. And so I thought that was a a new life as homeowners. And um, I I would rather give I would rather give preference to um, people who are starting out um, than to flippers or um, people who are companies who just buy property just to make a profit. I think that that goes with our uh, affordable family housing. It's going to be a lot of work <laughs> for sure for a young couple, um, but. Um, but I, I just feel like that's that's where my value system is is lying at the moment. Yeah. Um, I, I'm. How do I say this? I'm kind. Of, boy, I'm having a. <laughs> I'm struggling for words tonight. Um, I'm disappointed with the order that this is happening. Um, it would have been lovely to not had a first meeting where we got into this and yeah. then have an evaluation come in after we already made a decision. Uh, we mentioned values. I think. Uh, I think values are in play here as well. Um, I think I still, I'm going to continue with the dis what we discussed on Monday as far as throwing which pot I'm going to throw my bean in, shall we say. And that's because um, it's erring on the side of caution. It's erring on the side. This We had an estimate from a couple of our staff uh, code enforcement, you know, that sort of thing. It's not a professional evaluation. That was made perfectly clear at the beginning of this. And if that family that we care about starting off gets into this and all of a sudden finds out things are a larger issue, then all of a sudden that family's absolutely toast. You know what I mean? What are they going to do then? You know, so, I mean, I'm not an expert. Maybe, maybe you are, Cheryl. I don't know. You know, it'd be lovely if that worked, you know, but it's like, um, and also I think we were presented information, we're asked to make a decision and we got it. I feel like we're moving the goalposts. I'm not an what expert, is? Sam, but I have done, I have renovated houses before and I have been in that situation before. So well, no, of course, but experience it's like the and, and mold and the potential of, you know, landscaping. The mold again, can be remediated. Some can. It's, a, it's, some it's totally, care. seriously, Sam, this is your opinion and that's fine. So that's, well, that's what they and so, but I, I just, I'd hate to have my opinion put somebody in a position where all of a sudden they're in way over the head with, with something. I, that's why I, with my little old opinion, uh, go with, they put, they put right. in the bid. I'm assuming that they're adults and that they know what they can handle. So right. they put the bid in and that's, I'm that's how I'm, that's how I'm seeing it. Okay. So, so we've, uh, I guess I'm, I, we've heard two different opinions on this and the directions that we should go in. Let's, uh, Let's see if there are other counselors who want to speak out on it. Well, I, I will. I um, OK, so I was the counselor last time that was questioning why everybody wanted to tear it down pre once again, the conversation about whether or not somebody can handle the space or not. However, we made a commitment to something and I actually bent my way of thinking to go to this individual. I, I, I feel like it is what we did. Going forward, maybe when we look at these properties and how we handle them, maybe they should be best handled in the manner that it was handled, flip, flipped, I guess. Um, look at it, assess it, then put it out there. I, I, I don't know, you know, I feel badly for the individual that we said yes to only go back and say no. Um, uh, and, and, and that's based on our part. Um, um, but keeping in mind that going forward that we don't let this happen again. So that's where I stand. So um, 
your preference would be to stay with the decision that we made on Monday? Yes. Okay. Um, so when I look at all of the pieces of information again, and this is what I said on, on Monday, um, my primary concern is um, relief for the neighbors, right? The people in the neighborhood have had to deal with this for longer than they should have. It's been dragging. And so for me, when I look at the proposals that say nine to 12 months, I, I don't like those proposals because I think, you know, um, to get things into a shape where the neighbors don't have to deal, I mean, people's property values or, if, you know, pe folks who are trying to sell their homes or just having to look at that every day, forget about the safety issues that might be around. So, um, you know, making sure that the, that whomever we negotiate with, that that timeline is, brisk and aggressive is my primary concern. So for me, I don't have a problem sticking with the original uh, proposal that we chose because by December 15th, that property will look like something better than it looks now, according to the proposal. That was the timeline that was fastest. Um, but if, if the rest of council were really invested in trying to either get more money for that property or to um, you know choose, a family that was going to rehab the home if the rest of council felt strongly about that I wouldn't argue only that I I would be comfortable with the proposals there are I think one or two that mentioned a six month um, timeline but I wouldn't I, I I want someone who's really aggressively going to take care of this property so that the impact it has on the neighborhood is what is mitigated first and foremost um, so that's that's where I am Okay, anybody else would like to speak to this? That would be Lori or you, Tom. Yep, I got it. <laughs> Lori, anything that you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, I, I, I was one who said, if, if, if we only choose one be, that's gonna demolish it because we think it needs to be demolished, then we should let everyone know that. So now we have more information that it doesn't necessarily need to be demolished um, by a non-thorough investigation that we didn't pay for. So it's still unclear as far as, you know, no one can stake their investment on that. They're still basically in the same, they should be in the same situation they were before if they haven't been able to do a thorough analysis and they weren't allowed in the building. So I actually thought the one that proposed on Monday, I thought the one that proposed that they would try to fix it. And if not, then they would demolish it. Seemed like the one that had the most understanding of how unknown this is. Uh, we did, we already made a pre-decision that we weren't gonna do it based on dollars. We were gonna, and we were gonna, one of the reasons was because we wanted to make sure that the, that we felt confident in the person or company that was bidding. Uh, and so that's why when we saw these before, there was a paragraph that talked about that none of the none of the people are known to the town as being a problem. So uh, so I feel like that was we followed through on that one piece. I also feel uncomfortable that there was, although we didn't actually vote, I, what I thought we we said the other day was I thought the town manager said that that she was going by the direction of the majority of the council that all said to go with the one that said that they would demolish. Mm. So um, I too, like you, Sam, I kind of feel like, I, I want us to have a very clear process and not have people feel like we've gone back on the decision. It wasn't a decision that was voted on and I wasn't, if we, in the informal polling, I was the person that was not comfortable with us going with the one that was gonna be demolished without telling everyone else that's why we went with it. In advance. So anyway, that's just to to my recap is uh, the positive that all of these are going to try to address the issue, which is we have an eyesore of a property that's a tax was a tax burden and now is owned by us. And our goal is to uh, relief release release that property so that it can become a home again, and the, so that it's not an eyesore or a safety hazard. And it seems like all of the people that bid have that as a goal too. So I, I, I support Megan's suggestion that we might look at timeline since we've already decided in advance that money wasn't gonna be the issue. 
And so Megan suggested timeline and uh, I guess maybe a summary of which ones look like they're in the timeline. However, I guess once we sell it to someone, we can't, can we hold them to a timeline? That's the other thing. They, they might, you know, it's an aspirational document and how much of that aspirational document can we make as part of our transaction? Mm. That's what I think. So I would say that um, the way we could deal with this, Lori, is um, if you decided to try to hold somebody to a different kind of timeline, um, enter into a purchase and sale agreement, take a deposit um, that they, I've given you a, um, kind of the maximum um, timeline that I would suggest, which was um, the trees in the rear had to be taken down, the roof replaced, the bulkhead door secured in the grounds and the, the grounds cleaned up and maintained within 30 days. So that essentially gets you into property maintenance standard compliance. Um, then when they did that, um, the, the um, actual transit transfer of ownership would happen and the rest I think is, is a requirement in the deeds. So it becomes a contract, which we would then have to try to enforce. This is unlike, this is just too much money that has to get outlaid to ask them to do all of this on a purchase and sale agreement. Right. That That is not, I don't think that would, that is fair. I don't think anybody would do that. Well, it, it, having it a, something that has to be cleaned up within a short period of time meets this criteria of removing the problem from the, that the neighbors are seeing. And that, that you're talking about the one that says that they'll demolish. So basically it would end up being an empty lot for sale within 30 days. Is that what you're saying? Or you just... So if you go with the empty lot that's demolished, he's given you what he's gonna do and you would write your, you would construct your agreement that way. What I, I thought you were asking, how did, would you keep a renovation kind of on target? That's the answer I gave you. Okay. Was how to keep a rent so that you would get the outside cleaned up, which is the impact to the community, to the neighborhood. Um, well, so just to clarify and help me to clarify, because I don't have my copies right in front of me tonight, but um, the offer to demolish that was the, and to cap it was the immediate goal, but he was. I think they were planning on building with affordable housing as the end result down the road. I just don't know if we had a timeline attached to that. Could we put a timeline within a year, within two years? You can send me with any direction that you want. You can negotiate. There it is. Well, we, we got a document that gave the projected price of 180 to 200 and some thousand dollars. However, uh, if it if they did renovate a three bedroom house um, on that street and it was new newly done, I'm sh I, my sense is that's a low number, that, and therefore it, it doesn't already at 180 it doesn't meet what Sophie gave us as the state's definition for Orno of affordable housing, and right because it's over 175 thousand dollars. Sophie, on the uh, on the proposal to demolish the house, was refresh our, my memory at least. Uh, I, I think Sam was asking the same thing. Was there a, was there a time frame for um, tearing it down, and then was there a time frame for putting another house there? So when we look at the proposal. Um, the time frame was to um, demolish the property if we transferred ownership November 1st, which probably wouldn't happen, but um, by 45 days after transfer of ownership, the demolish demolition would be complete. Um, when the property is transferred, they'd start pumping out the water in the basement and re removing any wild animals that have taken up residence. 
They would contact tree cutters to remove the widow makers in the backyard. Once the building was demolished, but no later than December 15th, they would cap the building, securing an impermeable water barrier over the cellar hole. Within 90 days of the cellar hole being capped, he would have it tested for biological and chemical contaminants. Um, I, it, my, the sentence that you're referring to, um, oh, he would bush, brush and bush hog the backyard and remove the trees. Um, the sentence you're referring to, Sam, is in the end when he just he has said, um, in order for Orono to continue to provide the experience I had there, there needs to be uh, affordable homes for first time home buyers. My proposed future use of the property would be to rebuild a home which would fit the character of the neighborhood and be affordable for first time home buyers. And, and we could, through the negotiation process, if we went in this direction, we could, we could put in a timeline for that, I assume. Yeah. So the, uh, the advantage of going last <laughs> is I get to hear what everybody else says, and, and I'm really torn on this issue. Um, on the one hand, I agree with those who uh, are reluctant to go back on a decision that we've already made. On the other hand, I appreciate the fact that we now have some information that we didn't have. I, I wish we'd had it before, but, um, but we have it now. And, and based on that information, renovation looks like a more reasonable path than removal and one of the renovation um, proposals um, provides uh, twice as much town revenue as as the demolition proposal uh, i i recognize that we've said that money wasn't the primary factor but as a finance committee chair i i have to wonder about um about the difference between those proposals money wise especially if the town gets to keep uh, the, keep that money, except for the, uh, the water charge. So I'm, I'm not sure what direction to go in. Um, I guess the majority has said that they would either prefer to stay with the original decision or can live with staying with the original decision. Is that a fair reading, folks? I was kind of taking notes as we we're going down. <laughs> I'd say, kind of, well, almost sort of, I, <laughs> I guess I said, not that I would, um, well, I, that if, if there were other proposals that folks wanted to entertain, that I'm open to that completely. And yes, I, you know, it's not about the money, but if, if the balance gets to stay with the town, that is a, an important factor. Um, <clears throat> I'm most interested in the proposals that really discussed an aggressive timeline. So um, for example, the the $33,000 proposal had a six month timeline and did also talk about, um, I think that was the folks who uh, they bought a, a wrecked home and they fixed it up and currently live in it. So um, they want to make like a single family home out of it that would be um, along those same lines. So I, I would be comfortable with that proposal if that was where the majority went. Also, um, the second to last proposal, which is a 21,000, um, it listed an eight month timeline, but made specific mention of um, getting certain aspects cleaned up immediately. So it, it sounds from their timeline as though it would not be dangerous or an eyesore anymore after the first couple of months that they had ownership, I would be comfortable with a proposal like that. Um, so that's 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 where I am. Do you, Megan, do you know what, what letter that one is that you just talked about? Well, my packet didn't have letters on them, but I, I counted oh. out the <laughs> I, I counted out the letters as I was looking at them and I think uh, so I'm I have the third proposal, which I guess you'd call C is this is the thirty three thousand dollar one. The eighteen thousand dollar demo one would be E, I guess. It's the one, two, three, four, fifth one, and then the second to last one, or maybe H. I don't know. <laughs> is the so the, so the demo 
proposal was F, I believe. Oh yeah, I, I don't have letters on mine. <laughs> and the um, thirty-three thousand dollar bid was D. Okay. <laughs> and and if we didn't go with um, F, personally, D would be the only other one that I would um, that I would support. Um, you know, uh, traditionally, when we've gone what, up to bid, which, what's the sorry, what's the dollar amount for E? For D, I don't have D, oh, D, D is, okay. is the is the proposal. Um, the thirty three. The thirty three thousand dollar bid, and the six months to uh, to renovate it. Um, in in all in all other, or most all other situations, where we are selling property. Um, we would look at the highest bid. Um, I think we got into a lot of other issues Monday night, and and I certainly was one that got into those issues. But um, but I think that that D it's it's pretty hard to argue against taking the highest bid when we talk about the limited resources that our town has. I support that. Um, yes, and and I the only reason that I I'm maybe other counselors I'm sure have the same feeling, but the only reason that I really advocated for the teardown is because I everything I'd heard about that property I believed that it was just a teardown, so yep. that was what really motivated my decision there. Um, Tom, I think we we have a participant who's asking if they can speak, and I don't know whether you want to entertain that question or. Hmm. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I don't, Sophie, what's your advice on that? Um, my advice is you could do whatever you wish, but the hand just came down. So I would say that that individual is not, and perhaps if you guys want to continue your conversation, I, I think Tom, you're not under any obligation to allow okay. for public comment, but you absolutely can. Okay. So I think I would not at this point, um, I think we've got a couple of different proposals here. Do we want to try to resolve this tonight? Do we want to think about it some more? Come back to it at our next meeting? Oh, it's just getting good, Tom. Let's do it tonight. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm still casting my vote for I. <laughs> so um I'm, I don't I'm know a... where that falls. That's twenty one thousand. Um and I'm not yep. sure of the time. I don't have it in front of me either. I'm not sure of the timeline. Tom, I, I, I do have one question to ask of counselors. In the last meeting we discussed this, it wasn't so much about like the teardown that was the issue, it was about people were conversing about whether or not somebody could afford it. If What if they run into other things? What's changed tonight that changes people's minds to kind of swing? I'm just curious. The new information. When I heard black mold and I that, that was my, um, my understanding is that black mold, when it gets into a house, gets into the walls and gets gets in everything, and that you really only have one choice. Right. Um, but, I, but I also, but I also said that I hadn't seen the house, and I didn't vote for um, for the for the demolition either. I would go along, but the new information has um, has given me new uh, new new thinking, and so since we have the opportunity to do that. Um, that is how I, that's how I see it. And I read every single proposal again um, this morning and I'm, um, I'm, I'm, that's how I'm feeling about that. So um, that was my reasoning on Monday. Um, my reasoning has changed. Thank you, Cheryl. I, but I also want council to understand that when we move forward as a collective group, you can say that you're not voting for something, but if we move forward as a group, it is in essence saying that we agree that that's what it's going to be. And so um, I, I will go with the majority of the council. However, I, I'm still gonna have an issue about when people perceive us as switching our minds because of something that got bumbled in essence. And I mean, Cheryl, I mean, you may not agree with me, but the reality still is we went and said to a per, what if it was to you? If I went to you and said, yes, Cheryl, you're gonna be the person that we, we agreed to and also would say, well, wait a minute, 
I'm going to now put that back away from you. So I'm, that's, that's okay. Terry, we don't have to have consensus. No, no, I'm not, I'm not having a discussion. It's okay. It's, it's okay. It's all right. We don't have to have I, I consensus. I, sure. I was on the fence on Monday and I'm not now. So okay. that's all it I'm is. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that for me personally, I will go with the majority of the council, what they feel. However, I do have an issue about when we go and say we're going to do something and then three days later, when somebody maybe already has their mindset on this and we're going to say no. So that's all I'm saying. And that's where I'm at. I just let the record show. I still like all of you, uh, <laughs> but I am, I, I think I I'm still staying with what we uh, decided Monday. I think, um, yeah, I think there are a number of reasons why I'm doing it. And also, I mean, I had no idea who this individual, who any of the individuals are. I want that perfectly clear. But um, I think it's, <clears throat> I think it's important. I think, you know, it kind of, to me, it's resonated the whole character counts things. And I think, you know, I think we are kind of moving things a little bit. I understand all, all the arguments made and all the things and, and I respect them all, but just for me, I'm staying with our decision on Monday. Okay. So I've got uh, Sam staying with Monday's decision. I, I think, Terry, I'm reading you correctly in saying that your preference would be to stay with Monday's decision. Yes, my preference would be that, but I can, yep. I, I can listen. I just, I just wanted to make it a point that on Monday, when everything, it was like a whole totally different dialogue about whether or not somebody could afford something, and then now we're okay. So. And we know that Cheryl prefers a different um, proposal. So she's, uh, again, Cheryl, correct me if I'm misstating it. Um, you are not in favor of staying with Monday. You'd like to go with a different, with a different proposal based on the new information. Yes, that's correct. Um, Megan? I mean, I would say that we should, and again, we're all, we're talking about opening a negotiation, not accepting a proposal. Right. Right. So right. Um, I, I would say that, you know, I agree, Tom, that generally speaking, council practice is to accept the highest bid, when, you know, unless there's some other factor. For me, the other factor on Monday was that from everything I'd heard, I believed it was a teardown and that someone else would just find themselves in deep water. So. Right. I, I would say that we should open the negotiation with the highest bidder and feel out how fast that timeline could be because ultimately what's most important again to me is how fast can we make this palatable for the neighborhood that has to live with it. So you would go with, um, your preference would be D, which was the highest bidder and negotiate the, the time schedule. Although that bidder said he'd have his work done in six months. Yes. Are we, Tom, are we doing this ranked choice voting? What's how, what's this? Here? <laughs> I mean, we each have a bid going on. You know, I'm, I'm trying to get. Curious. I'm trying to. I mean, or is it like four tear down here. or against, and then we're going to hammer out which one? I'm just curious. Yeah, and, and we're not doing ranked choice, but I'm doing. I'm, I'm trying to get a consensus if we can move on, or if we want to take more time with it. I mean, we've been here this whole long. I want to try to get this figured out. So sounds like there's three of us that are uh, suggesting that we, that Sophie begin the negotiation with the highest bidder. Right. That's correct. So that, um, so three for, for A, highest bidder and three for different approach and one that is abstaining from this participation. So, gee. So we, but we have three, two and one and then Correct. And an abstention. Correct. This, this though is, is <laughs> um, either way we look at this Tom, if I end up coming over to this camp, I am really still not happy about when the conversation happened on Monday, yeah. if it was assumption based or whatever, because everybody was jumping on, tear it down. Because when I questioned whether or not somebody could do the project, that was the worry. So um, going forward though, 
to try to figure out how we not do get in the same boat again. Yeah, I, I don't think any of us are happy with this situation, Terry. Uh, I don't, I'm sure that Sophie's not happy with it. Um, we're going to have an unhappy bitter, no matter what we do, and I feel very badly for that. Okay, because um, I've been on the fence with this, uh, but having said what you said, I I will go to the higher bidder um, to move us along with the understanding that we we definitely work to not get ourselves in this predicament ever again. Yes, I think we all agree on that too. So Sophie, do you have some direction here? Based on what I'm hearing, I'm hearing a couple of things, but based on what I'm hearing, you're asking me to open up discussion with the highest bidder, try to narrow the timeline down and, and ascertain what, um, what um, he would be willing to do in terms of speeding up the, um, out the property maintenance. Um, elements. So that I can, I can do that. My second question is if talks break down with that person, do I come back? Do I go to the second highest bidder or do I go to um, somebody else? <laughs> I think you come back. Okay. Um, the second thing I'm hearing is that council doesn't want to use a negotiated bid process again for tax acquired property like this, that um, it is a matter of um, so either that or you want to take on liability of doing building inspections before we um, put them out, which there are reasons why we don't do that. Um, this is supposed to be a paper transaction. Um, so uh, I think council wants to think about when we get to the tax acquired property um, to actually sell it, what if we have an issue with code in the future, what we could do, it's a little riskier we can just transfer ownership and then at the same time, give them a notice of violation and give them a reasonable amount of time to clean it up. Mm -hmm. um, so I think instead of trying to meet multiple needs, it would be my recommendation that you go back to paper transactions. And if there are code issues, we deal with the code issues. I think you're right. That's what we had Monday, wasn't it? But anyway. Excuse me, Sam. Okay. Isn't that what we had Monday though? I mean, it, it feels like things are complicated after Monday, but anyway. I need to go. Bye everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye Laurie. So we're ready to leave this item, I believe, and move on to manager's report or update. Five minutes. Um, I don't want to take a ton of your time. Um, so we have, we have been in full election mode at Town Hall. Uh, staff, I think, has been doing a remarkable job. Uh, today, we held a day of in-person absentee voting at um, in council chamber, and that's just a um, walk-in. Uh, you don't have to make an appointment for that. Uh, at the end of the day, we brought in 411 new ballots, so that that is what we dealt with today. We are close to or at 3,000 absentee ballots. So that's wow. pretty remarkable. Um, One more time. 3,000, three, zero, zero, zero. Um, so I, um, tomorrow we will also have uh, walk-in absentee voting. Uh, so from 7.30 a.m. until 5 p.m. in council chamber. Uh, People should understand that on election day, when you, um, if you show up at the polls, we are limited to the number of people that we can have inside at one time. So we can have 50 people registering to vote and 50 people voting, and that's it. So if it's 22 degrees outside and it's uncomfortable, 
Um, that is, you know, I, I really hope we don't dissuade people from voting, which is why we're really trying to push people to come in, trickle in, as opposed to um, have to wait in long lines on election day. Sophie, um, on, on election day, it's at the University of Maine Fieldhouse. Is that correct? It is. It is. And it's not. Um, it's not about how many people we can fit with social distancing. We are capped at 50 people in each area. Um, so um, we're, it's wonderful to see people engage. And I will tell you, it has been amazing to see all of our election workers, lots of new faces um, coming in. Well, I can't really say faces because they all have masks on. So I probably wouldn't recognize them if I saw them. Um, out and about, but um, they've just, they've been doing a great job. Um, and Belle's gonna correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that after Friday, we are in a closed period. So you need so to- So even, even tomorrow, um, the only way to get a ballot to take home would be to show up um, either in person or to um, sign the affidavit saying that there are special circumstances, which is why you need to request the ballot. Tomorrow you are able to come up, cast a ballot in person with um, no affidavit necessary. Um, a little bit of changing guidance that we have received from the Secretary of State's office on that one. So we'd like to see as many people as we can possibly get through the doors tomorrow, which will cut down on how many people we got to get through the doors on Tuesday. Belle, do you have a sense of um, how many college students are going to be there on Monday at the field house? On Monday or Tuesday? I mean, Tuesday. Um, in order to vote or to, to vote. volunteer? No, to vote. Well, so I ran the numbers this morning, Cheryl, and we had issued um, just over 3,000 um, absentee ballots um, and had had a little bit over 2,500 come back. Um, after this, um, after today, we had um, a lot of ballots come back and a lot more voted. So that's how we got to be voted at a little over 3,000. We expect turn out to be somewhere around 6,000. Um, so right now, Shelly and I are shaking in our boots because we've done the math and it says that if we have 3,000 people that come through on um, election day over the course of 13 hours and if they come in at a steady state and we can only have 40 voters on the floor at a time because we have you know, workers also there, then we have to turn that floor over um, essentially every 10 minutes. Um, so we've got to turn it over six times in an hour in order to get everybody through. So we really want to encourage people to vote. Right, exactly. Yeah, I was I was just, yeah, thank you, Belle. More math than you really wanted, I'm sure, but uh, mm -hmm. that's how I do. I, I was gonna say, I can't imagine math, uh, Belle attacking any problem without math, somehow. <laughs> um, so uh, along with election, we also are um, dealing with um, the surge in COVID-19 cases, both nationally and in the state. The town is participating as a pilot with the university with um, COVID testing. Um, the the uh, up until now, the tests for both the university and the town have all been scientifically negative. So at times you can see um, COVID shed. This is not live COVID virus. They're picking up the RNA. Um, you can see it in the in the system, but it has been you know minimal to not not able to detect. Um, we received notification today that there is a um, there was a small uptick in um, the the what was found in in off campus um, water so that's everything that's campus in town when it comes in so we had a, a really good meeting with campus officials uh, scientists the CDC um, and what we're being told is this is expected this the state is is surging. We do not know what those numbers mean. The way this test 
works. Um, this is not something to get panicky about. This is a, a small blip. We should expect it. Um, the town and the campus are going to work together um, with some public information going out. So over the um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I think you'll see some um, new uh, media out there just reminding folks, you know, we are months into this system and it's easy for people to let their guard down. And we just wanna remind folks to use good behaviors. That's the way to, to um, make this, um, to keep people as, as healthy and safe as we can. So the reason I bring this up is um, because I did give the okay today for Orono's pilot COVID testing numbers to be placed on the website with the University of Maine's as kind of an asterisk. Um, I think if we have information, it's kind of incumbent upon us to get it out there for the for the community to see it. And I wanted it to be in a place where it could make sense with other numbers. Um, so we will link when when it's up, we will link our website, um, put a link on our website to those numbers on the COVID page of our website. Um, any questions about that? Can't say enough about university's team. Rob Wheeler and Jean McRae as the scientists and then Bob Dana and I can't even be a laundry list of names, but a lot of really good people. And the kids, Sophie, are going home November 25th, November 25th. November 25th, they have to be out of the dorms. Um, we still will likely see um, a pretty significant population that will stay. We'll have students that can't go home and other students that might go home for Thanksgiving, but choose to come back to do their online learning in, in this environment. But campus, my understanding is that dorms will be closed. Ready to move on? Yep. Um, Maine Municipal Health Trust gave me my annual last week of October call. And this is usually when I come to you crying because the rates are going up. Um, wellness, our wellness program is good. Um, COVID being here has kept a lot of people from getting medical attention. Um, they don't wanna go to doctors. They don't wanna go to the hospital. They're delaying elective surgeries. Um, which means that our um, loss run rate or our use rate is very, very low in the, in the system, which has worked to our financial advantage this year. Um, they called to tell me that there will be no rate increase. So our rates will hold steady. So that will be really, that, that is good in the budget. Um, and then the last, I can finally say, the bond is over. We, we <laughs> receded the money. People have been paid that need to be paid. Um, and my plan is to give a final um, accounting to the finance committee when we meet on the 5th, I think. Do we meet on the 5th, Tom? I don't have it right in front I of me. I think it's the 5th. Sounds right. Yeah, it's the 5th. Um, and um, that will come with some budget adjustments to move some debt payment money around just so it makes sense. And yep. we'll talk a little Good. bit about the structure and how we're going to account for that. But I think that is it. Thank you for that report. Any other business to come before the group? Tom, can I say one? Nice? I, Go ahead. Uh, I, just, I just want to add one thing. Uh, just thank you, Sophie, for that update. That's all pretty amazing stuff. I do want to also address just um, the previous conversation about the property. And I want to clarify my comment at the end was, I was surprised that it changed from Monday it was my only thing. Sophie, you looked a little shocked when I said, I wasn't upset or I making any accusation. I want to acknowledge the work you've done to navigate this really <laughs> tricky, shall we say, complex tightrope once again with the, with the, you know, trying to do the right thing and keeping the town of Orono uh, as welfare in mind. So I just want to acknowledge that because I think I came across as a bit of a barbed attack and that was not it at all. So I just want to set the record straight publicly. Nothing Thank like you, Sam. Zoom, nothing like Zoom to do that, right? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're all set then. Then I'll take a motion to adjourn. And then we'll just wait. Oh. We're all in favor, I'm sure. 
Thank you, Sophie. Thank, Thank you. you all. Bye-bye.